It is 13 minutes to the hour. You're tuned to Paris Live PM on Radio France International and our technicians are having some fun with the buttons there. But uh, it's time now for Live on Live and uh, we return to Iran where it's the last day of campaigning ahead of this Friday's presidential elections, the first polls following a landmark nuclear deal in 2015. Incumbent President Hassan Rouhani is facing stiff competition from hardline conservatives who want to see the country become more self-reliant and less vulnerable to the West. The race has focused heavily on the economy, tackling high unemployment and growing inequality, and it's being seen as a referendum on how Rouhani has handled the economy under the terms of the nuclear deal. Well, to help us understand what's at stake, uh, we welcome to the studio international lawyer and Middle East analyst Ardavan Amir Aslani. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Now, Rouhani was elected in 2013 with a mandate to resolve the standoff over Iran's nuclear program and to remove UN sanctions. He's done that. Uh, not so long ago, he was a clear front runner. Now there's talk of the election going to a second round. What's turned the tables? He is still the front runner. Uh, there is a parallel to be made between what may become of the Iranian elections and what happened in France. People in Iran, 70% of whom are on the age of 40, are sick and tired of a return to the past, of those who are personifying extreme Islamic conservatism, who want to shut down the borders. So Rouhani may not be as favored as he was a couple of years ago, but he still is the best choice available in comparison to those that are running against him. It is true, however, that he is no longer as popular as he was four years ago. Why is this? Because he basically overpromised as to the positive consequences that the adoption of the nuclear agreement would entail for the Iranian economy. He gave the impression that following the signature of this agreement, billions of dollars would run into the country, millions of jobs would be created, and that Iran would be transformed into an El Dorado. He was mistaken in doing that. He overpromised and underdelivered. Not that he didn't want to do it, he couldn't. And this is primarily because of US sanctions, those that were not lifted pursuant to the nuclear agreement, those that were in place ever since the Iranian Revolution took place, going back to 1979 and 80, sure. the US hostage crisis, those that hit Iran on the grounds of alleged support for terrorist groups and human rights issues. And these sanctions are the most important ones because they're the ones that block the transfer in US dollars. These are the ones that prevent American entities from doing business with Iran. These are the sanctions that f have frightened off the entire international banking community that has backed away with any project finance initiative in Iran. Sure. That's where the problem resides. So just uh, looking at the Iranian electorate, I mean, he, you say that he, he over-promised, and that's something that his critics have really seized upon, <clears throat> the fact that he, he has failed to improve conditions for poorer people. It's more of a longer-term uh, project, I suppose. Uh, number one, has it is it just too soon to see any economic advantage? And number two, what are the people in Iran saying? Are they patient? Are they prepared to, to wait? <clears throat> you see, it could have gone much quicker had it not been for U.S. sanctions. And honestly speaking, the election of Donald Trump is not going to help Rouhani in a second mandate if he's re-elected. The people of Iran are like any other people in the region, in the world, I'd say. They're 82 million, 70% of them are under the age of 40. They're highly educated. Farsi, their national language, is one of the most spoken languages on the Internet. They aspire to reintegrate the international community for Iran to become again part of the world financial system. They're hoping simply for jobs, for an opportunity to get married, to be able to rent a place to live in. They're not asking for much. And for this to happen, the regime has understood it needs to open up the doors of the Iranian economy. It hasn't been able to do that, despite all the good intentions that it has demonstrated. But we all know that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So, but under Rouhani, unemployment actually has risen, uh, particularly youth unemployment. Basically speaking, uh, Rouhani's record is not that bad. Um, he has managed to stabilize the Iranian economy. 
for the first time in four decades, inflation is no longer a double-digit number. Unemployment has increased, it is true, but this is more because of the fact that an entire new generation keeps on creeping into the employment market year after year. However, what he has not been able to do is to increase the industrial production of Iran. When you look at those numbers, you see that the gross national product of Iran is 7.5 now, pursuant to the nuclear agreement. It may sound huge, but when you bring it down to the reality of industrial production locally, the domestic production goes down to under 1%, to zero. So the reality is that despite all the gobbledygook, all the rhetoric out there, all the hope that was manifested by this administration because of U.S. sanctions and because also we have to be fair and honest because of the difficulties inherent to the huge and cumbersome bureaucracy that Iran has, it has been difficult for the economy to lift off. Now, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the electorate is is quite big. I think something like 55 million people are expected to vote on Friday. So I just want to look a little bit at that electorate. You mentioned that there are a lot of young people. uh, 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 Iranians tend to be very highly educated. Is there a, a divide between the older people, the younger people, the people who live in the cities, the people who live in rural areas? Your question is an answer all by itself. All three divides that you mentioned are out there. There's a generational divide, those that are young and aspiring to a different way of life, to those that are older. Those that are the haves, in comparison to the majority of the Iranians who are the have-nots. Also, another category, those who are profoundly religious and profoundly back the, the structure of the Islamic Iranian theocracy and those that aspire towards a much more secular form of government. All of these three different groups are going to clash together. And when you look at the sociology of the Iranian electorate, it hasn't changed since the, since the contested elections of 2009 when Ahmadinejad ran for a second term. When you look at it, you've got the students, the intelligentsia, the middle class, the educated, the, the well-off, who are going to vote for Rouhani, <clears throat> because in their mind he personifies an opening to the world, to the West, and the others. The others are those who are clients of the government and the system, those who are profoundly uh, in line with the theology that is being conveyed, and those who belong to the more rural provinces of Iran, who are uncomfortable with the urban way of life that large cities manifest. And these two groups have chosen their own candidate. That's why Rouhani is representing the more modern-looking, younger uh, portion of the electorate, while as Raisi, who, who is leading the largest Islamic foundation on the planet is is running for those that no longer identify with modernity. Okay, and I do want to get back to just looking at the differences between the the, the two main candidates and sort of reformist vers- versus populist approach. But first I want to ask you about the role of women. I mean, all of these candidates are men. Women hold posts on, on councils in local government Many of them are prominent scientists and engineers, but uh, is there a glass ceiling for women when it comes to politics? Unfortunately, uh, the function of the president, according to the Indian constitution, is reserved for men only. So female cannot run for the Iranian presidency. That being said, women are elected into the Iranian parliament, are members of the Iranian government, have occupied or occupy important responsibilities such as the vice presidency. But at the end of the day, they don't represent the uh, importance that they represent demographically within Iranian institutions. When you look at the female population, for example, you're looking at a population that represents 67% of the entire Iranian graduate schools. The first female Muslim Nobel Prize winner, Madame Ebadi, is an an Iranian. The first female Fields Medal winner in mathematics is another Iranian uh, female. So the women are out there aspiring to a greater share and a more legitimate share of the Iranian power structure. It's an aspiration for the moment. They're not there yet. Now, uh, no incumbent president in Iran has failed to win a second term since 1981. Uh, Rouhani, he has a lot of support from the the former president, uh, Mohammad Khatami, another reformer, uh, plus others, uh, one candidate who actually dropped out to back him. What will it mean for Iran and for all of the progress uh, that's been made uh, with other countries opening Iran up to the world if Rouhani fails to win a second term? No matter who gets elected in Iran, were he to be a reformist or a conservative, at the end of the day, all of them understand one simple fact. That is, if they want the government and regime to survive, if they want the theocracy 
to continue, if they want their own assets to be protected and for stability to remain in the country, they don't have any other alternative than siding by the nuclear agreement, the Joint Common Plan of Action, because they know that you cannot maintain the continuity of the Iranian system if you just content yourself by promising to the people restrictions of personal freedoms or unemployment. So you have to offer them something else. That's what this nuclear agreement is about. It's not only about enhancing and uh, uh, developing the economic life of the Iranians. It's also about providing them with a greater degree of social freedom, with a greater degree of, of political freedom. It's about bringing Iran back into the national community. So both organizations, both categories, understand that the nuclear agreement is here to stay. The question is, how are they going to react to it in the future if, for example, the conservatives are going to come into power? They will have a much more, uh, I'd say, restrictive attitude in relation to the opening of the country. They're not going to fight for foreign investment to come to Iran. That's why they are uh, using this, this terminology that they have adopted for the last 24 months, talking economy of resistance, which is basically a, a, an attitude falling within the scope of fighting for self sustainability sustainability forever and not relying on, on foreign input and foreign investment. But that can't work. We all know it can't work. Just look at North Korea. And uh, foreign investors, are do they consider uh, Iran to be high risk or a, a, a safe bet? I mean, when you look at the Middle East, when you look at the area, the only country that is stable is Iran. I mean, look around Iran, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and even Saudi Arabia entangled in this horrendous, ongoing, never-ending war of attrition in Yemen. The only stable country in the area is Iran. And when they look at Iran, they not only identify the fact that Iran represents the largest proven gas reserves in the world, the fourth largest oil reserve in the world. They are also looking at this market, which is substantial, the most important market, with the uh, millions in the middle class, sure. highly educated population. So the, the, the country is very promising. However, it is high risk. Not that the country is going to end up in war, not that the country is going to end up in, 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 in a revolution, but simply because the country may continue continue in a state of inertia and stagnation if the country is unable to reach an agreement with the Americans. And I guess uh, we'll have to wait and see uh, who stands to lose the most if that uh, deal uh, doesn't work out. So our thanks there to today's Live on Live guest. (laughs) 